Uh, before joining the Future Fund, Wendy was an investment director with Hastings Funds Management. Please welcome Wendy. Um, good afternoon and, and thank you very much for, for the opportunity to speak to you today. It's exciting to be here at the beginning of, of this conference and, and to be talking on private markets at a time when lots of things are changing. So as we just heard, um, Future Fund was established as Australia's sovereign wealth fund in 2006 to strengthen the Australian government's long-term financial position. We invest that $200 billion across six public asset funds for the benefit of future generations of Australians. The largest fund is the Future Fund itself, which currently stands at just over 160 billion Aussie dollars. And we've added more than $100 billion in earnings to that original investment over the last 13 years. Uh, in the last financial year, Future Fund delivered a return of 11.5% per annum, and over the 10 years prior to that, 10 and 10.4% per annum. And our private markets investments in particular, private equity, contributed strongly to those results. So today, I'd like to touch on our perspectives on investing in private markets and how Future Fund is adapting to the current investment environment. So before I talk about the market, though, I'd like to introduce some exciting changes in the Future Fund team and describe how we approach private markets investing. In 2017, the government announced its intention to delay withdrawals from the Future Fund from, from 2020 to 2026. This means that the Future Fund will continue to grow through accumulated earnings for years to come. And in addition, the government also allocated additional funds for us to manage. Most recently, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Land and Sea Future Fund and the Future Drought Fund. Together with the Medical Research Future Fund, these perpetual portfolios exceed $20 billion in their own right, materially increasing our appetite for private markets investments. And these are major developments for us. They mark the beginning of a demanding new phase as we design and build our organisation to manage portfolios of substantial additional size and complexity while sustaining the success that we have achieved to date. Last year, we reviewed our organisational structure to reinforce three key functions, our investment process, our technology, and our risk management. All of this was designed to support efficient and flexible management of the portfolios as they continue to grow. These changes will strengthen the core investment philosophy that has benefited us since 2006. Our guiding principle, one team, one purpose. It's at the forefront of our mind and the centre of our investment process. Within the investment team, we created three new Deputy Chief Investment Officer roles, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, um, to bring public markets, private markets and portfolio strategy closer together in the way we think about managing the portfolio. I was appointed as the Deputy Chief Investment Officer for private markets and prior to that, I was the head of infrastructure and timberland at Future Fund. Uh, David George was appointed as the deputy CIO for public markets, and Sue Brake has recently joined us as the deputy CIO for portfolio strategy. Together with our chief investment officer, Raphael Arndt, the four of us lead the top down and bottom up elements of our investment strategy with a focus on a collaborative and joined up approach to investing. I was also delighted to welcome Alicia Gregory to the Future Fund as Head of Private Equity in April this year. Alicia brings outstanding experience as a leader and investor and is well positioned to further develop our successful private equity program. Sid Kotkar also recently joined as a senior member of the team. To give you a bit of insight into our process, I'll explain how the Future Fund goes about investing and how private markets fits in. Our investment approach is based on working together for the benefit of the portfolio as a whole. This is our one team, one portfolio philosophy. It drives our culture and the way we invest. When constructing our portfolios, we bring together top-down and bottom-up views. We call this being joined up. 
our top-down people look at the global economy, financial markets and political risk and think about how this will impact the portfolio and the level of risk that we can accept in the pursuit of our objectives. Our bottom-up people look across the world for great assets and investment managers, thinking about whether they are being well rewarded for the risks they are taking. We seek to uncover the best investment opportunities across all sectors, rather than the best opportunities in each sector, and then to act with conviction on these opportunities. In this way, we pursue diversification at a total portfolio level, rather than creating a series of self-contained sector portfolios. By blending together the big picture and the local insights, the macro and the micro, we generate a rich and nuanced view of the opportunities and outlook, which enables us to create portfolios where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. This joined up process leads us to a portfolio construction that is very far from the typical 60-40 split between public market asset classes of bonds and equities. In fact, as of 30 June 2019, the Future Fund had investments in private equity, private debt, property, infrastructure, timberland and alternatives that totaled around 45% of the portfolio. So as you can see, private markets investments play an important role in Future Fund's portfolio. Um, as of the end of the last financial year, um, there was over $25 billion invested in private equity um, and nearly 16% of the total fund. So what does all that private equity do for us? It, it fulfills two functions. First, we think about pri the traditional private equity in the large buyout space. And in that, uh, for that strategy, we're seeking to invest in high alpha opportunities where we believe we can earn a significant premium over similar but more liquid public market equity investments. Secondly, in the venture space, we seek to invest in strategies that we can't readily access in public markets, innovation and small company growth. We invest primarily in funds and co-investments and will selectively use fund of funds for specific initiatives. And to achieve this, we build our team from industry professionals that have the skills to meet our managers as peers and the expertise to openly debate the merits of a deal with them. This helps us to understand the skill and insight that our managers bring to their fund portfolios, to be responsive to investment opportunities in real time, and to thoughtfully build our co-investment exposures. And to focus a bit more closely on venture, venture and growth capital play a significant role in our private equity program, with around $15 billion invested currently. It gives us access to the innovation cycle and it delivers us an uncorrelated risk exposure. We don't think about our venture capital program in terms of geography. Um, innovation is not bounded by geographical borders. We'd have a global perspective and when we're searching for the best ideas, we're looking everywhere. We look for opportunities in markets that can scale rapidly and have the potential to deliver the 10x outcomes that are so critical to the success of venture capital funds. That is why the US, with its large developed business and consumer markets, has been a focus for the fund in the first 10 years of our, of our portfolio build out. But we are also actively engaged in the development of the Australian venture market, both with investment dollars and by using our global network to develop and create opportunities for the industry. We have been pleased to partner with the Australian Investment Council to introduce some of our US fund of fund managers to the Australian market. This included Greenspring Associates in 2017 and Horsley Bridge earlier this year. Following their visit in 2017, Green Springs, that is, we created a dedicated Australian venture capital mandate with them where they are actively monitoring the market to assess opportunities in Australia. So turning now to the market landscape, the emphasis Future Fund has placed on private markets investments reflects a powerful trend in global investment flows. Over the past 20 years, we have witnessed a strong and sustained shift in the market landscape, with growing private markets on one hand and shrinking public markets on the other. I'm sure this is a theme you'll hear a lot about during this conference. 
private equity investments have grown twice as fast as public markets in the last decade. Private markets now account for more than $6 trillion, US trillion dollars of market value globally, and that's almost 10% of global investment assets. As McKinsey says, private markets have graduated from the fringes of the economy to the mainstream. We are in a envi market environment where loose monetary policy has led to an unprecedented supply of capital. And at the same time, advancements in technology have decreased the need for capital investment. These forces have combined to produce a sustained period of low interest rates and low inflation that you'll hear lots of people talking about. Investors, as a result, have more money to invest and fewer attractive investment opportunities, which causes them to look for places where they can earn greater returns. The illiquidity, complexity and skill premia that are available in private markets start to look very attractive in this scenario. Consequently, when investing in equity markets, private equity is becoming an increasingly important consideration in portfolio construction. This brings with it a couple of challenges. The first is it takes greater manager skill to navigate all of that complexity, and investors pay away a larger proportion of that excess return through fees when you're investing via private versus public markets. Secondly, as an investor, you end up with a less flexible portfolio, and there is a very real risk that you may not be able to meet the liquidity demands of your beneficiaries when they make them. So that means that all investors, including the future fund, need to be thoughtful about how they navigate the balance of risks and rewards in private markets and how they can gain access to the best opportunities while all the time continuing to adapt and improve their investment processes to keep up. These market changes are also having an impact on the PE and VC industries. In the private equity market, we see fund managers that are awash with capital, striving to deliver the same returns that they have delivered in the past. This is despite strong market competition for deals and less use of leverage. Everyone is working harder to try to produce their desired returns. In the past, managers could buy almost any company, add some leverage and sell it in a few years' time at a comfortable profit. Today's market requires them, to, uh, requires them to take every opportunity to add value at every stage through the life cycle of the investment. As you'll hear from some of the GPs that you'll hear from over the course of this conference, operating teams are becoming more and more prevalent. Fund managers are investing in technology to improve efficiency in deal sourcing and in due diligence. Leverage is being used more intelligently. As they seek to maximise their competitive advantage, great managers are leaving no stone unturned. In the venture capital market, the sustained inflow of money means entrepreneur entrepreneurs have more funding options than ever before. This gives young companies much more scope to grow in private markets without having to deal with all the regulation that goes with public listing. Staying away from public markets allows entrepreneurs to take a long-term view and ride out market cycles. They can keep growing at a rapid pace without focusing on short-term profitability or providing the kinds of detailed information about their strategies that they would have to provide in public markets. Not surprisingly, venture companies are staying private for longer, stretching the definitions of venture and growth. As companies no longer look to public markets to fund their expansion stages, growth funds, select funds, greatest hits, private funds are supplanting the role of IPOs. Those companies that do go public are acquired or are acquired by a public company are much older and more mature than they were in the late 1990s. Venture fund managers are responding to the competitive environment by pulling every lever they can. Where private equity firms have developed operating teams, venture capital firms place more emphasis on the human element. By building networks of business growth experts and CEO whisperers, they cultivate their entrepreneurs and guide management teams to lead larger and more mature companies. However, from an investor perspective, the return dispersion between the best and worst performing venture funds is large 
and average market performance has been, well, average. According to Bridgewater, when you look at the average market returns from venture funds over the last 20 years, there has been little return for illiquidity or the higher risk of early stage companies. Total, total venture capital returns post fees have underperformed both private equity and small cap stocks in, in all but the five years immediately post the, the GFC. In the more recent past, a lot of the supercharged returns that used to be seen in the public markets for newly listed companies have disappeared, with recent IPOs tending to perform in line with overall listed equity market performance. This is consistent with companies IPOing at a more mature stage of their life cycle. Returns from young, younger companies have shifted from public to private markets. So how is Future Fund adapting to all these changes? As I mentioned earlier, for Future Fund, venture remains the key way that we access the innovation cycle and disruptive technology, and it will continue to hold a prominent place in our portfolio as a result. To ensure that we end up earning an acceptable return for the risk, we're keeping a laser-like focus on partnering with top quartile managers that are responding proactively to the changing macro environment. It puts the onus on us to make active, more active hold or sell decisions about the individual stocks that we end up owning when managers do exit their, um, their positions into the public markets. And it also requires us to actively adjust our investment pacing decisions to reflect the longer expected hold periods across private equity, venture and growth. We, like the fund managers that we invest with, have more capital to manage and we are working harder to maintain returns in a low interest rate environment. We are investing in our organisation, enhancing our technology capability, which is giving us more insight into our portfolio exposures. We're also uplifting our leadership skills as we push ourselves to collaborate, to collaborate more effectively and to make better investment decisions. We're working the portfolio harder to ensure that every ex exposure we hold is delivering the right outcome. We're also focusing on getting the right balance of flexibility and return in our portfolio overall. To this end, we have exited about $5 billion of private markets investments in the last couple of years. When assets become mature and the expected look forward return has decreased, we look to sell them and redeploy the capital within the portfolio. The increasing maturity of secondary markets is helping us to optimise the portfolio that we hold today, and we are focused on ensuring, ensuring that we are in the best possible position to maximise returns without taking excessive risk in the future. So what is Future Fund looking for in investment managers? We know that capital is abundant right now, but we continue to look for partnerships that will stay with us through the long term. Capital availability is like a pendulum, and whilst it is very favourable towards managers right now, we know that this will swing back at some stage, and those who treat us well when capital is abundant will find us to be a great partner through leaner times. We are always seeking strong and consistent investment processes which value diversity of perspective and that limit downside risk without cutting off the opportunity for the outperformers that significantly influence overall fund performance. We also value robust fund manager business structures with considered sharing of economics and thoughtful team development and succession planning. Partnership and an open two-way dialogue are becoming even more important to us. Asset owners face higher scrutiny and as we seek to be a responsible investor through the investments we make, we place more emphasis on understanding the way our managers engage with their investee companies about social and environmental impacts. So let me conclude by thanking you once again for the opportunity to be here. Uh, the Future Fund is in, in an exciting period of change and renewal as we embark on our next phase of growth. Private markets have graduated to the mainstream of portfolio construction as investors around the world seek diversifying opportunities that offer attractive risk return trade-offs beyond traditional public markets. 
We collectively face an investment environment where capital supply is plentiful and the look forward return environment is challenging, forcing or creating the opportunity for investors like us to respond by working harder to build more efficient processes and work their portfolios harder, while managers work harder to reinvest in their own value creation strategies. The investment environment is changing and we are adapting to it. We look forward to continuing to partner with the private equity and venture industries as we work towards generating strong returns for the benefit of future generations of Australians. Thank you. When we're thinking about investing the portfolio overall, we're constantly trying to think about what potential scenarios could play out in the global economy and is our portfolio structure robust to withstand any future scenario. So we think really carefully about how much we're investing into illiquid asset classes so that we don't land ourselves into a, an excessive problem if there's a major market crash. So that's kind of one of the natural tensions that we're constantly balancing is the balance between public and private Is there a benchmark there over which you must not go? What we do is we dynamically um, assess the portfolio's performance as if there was a crash every day. So we're constantly testing what would happen if the market crashed tonight. Would, would we find ourselves with too much liquidity or, or not enough? And so we're, we're using that kind of risk assessment as the way that we benchmark that. So given your stress testing all the time, let me ask you, how likely do you think that is? Um, <laughs> uh, we've, got a very, we've got a very conservative appro approach to risk taking. So our mandate says that we need to maximise return without taking excessive risk. And it's that excessive risk part that we're constantly balancing. When we try and think about, you know, how do we summarise our overall risk appetite, we think that it's probably in the, in, in the range of a, a, medium, um, a medium risk strategy in the superannuation industry. So we're looking to get as much return we, as we can without taking a high level of risk. Another question here from the floor. What do you think is the biggest challenge in ESG for the private capital industry? I think the challenge is to... Firstly, you've got to have the, your, your processes and, and systems in the right place from an investor perspective. Remembering that we're at the, end of the, at the end of the line, essentially. We're not on the coalface. So we start by having a clear process that screens for ESG at each stage of our investment process. But then we make sure that we're trying to turn that into robust and nuanced conversations as we partner with our managers going forward because the real change has to happen in the, in the, you know, in the companies at the end of the day. Do you see a difference, though, the ESG challenges in the private market versus the public market? Um, in the private markets, you have the opportunity to be a little closer to the decision makers because you can often have an influential um, scale of investment in a company. So it does give you the opportunity to have direct conversations with people that can influence those outcomes. Another question, you mentioned technology has helped improve private markets at the Future Fund. In what way? That could be a question that could take a really long time to answer, but anyway, I'll... <laughs> We're starting at the moment just by really kind of exposing all the information that is already sitting there in our portfolio so that now it's much easier for me to pull up on my device anywhere in the world what my private markets exposure is and then drill down into any sector any time. So just exposing the information that you've got is is really helps you make decisions in a much more timely fashion. It helps you to aggregate the exposures in ways that were much more laborious before. So it really helps you to be nimble about decision making, whereas before you might have had to you know, ask for somebody to go and do you a specific analysis that would take days to do. There's a lot of talk at the moment about fintech and just how far technology can go in terms of helping people with investment decisions. So how far do you think, I mean, you're talking very much now about providing information, clarity of information, speed of information. How far could technology go in helping the future fund with investment decisions? We'll continue to, involve, to evolve our use of technology so that we're able to continue to respond to the investment environment. So we'll take it as far as helps us to make better, faster 
more nimble investment decisions. Just a final question, which will help to lead into our next session, uh, which looks at broader economic outlook. But what's your strategy for China? China is is a is a big market. So, and in uh, particularly in venture, it has been attracting almost, I think it was close to half of the new investments in venture in the world last year were into the Chinese market. So we're very thoughtful about the opportunities that that can provide us, and we are also thoughtful about the risks that come with that. So we're at the moment um, progressing, you know, pro pro progressing forward with our exposure, but doing it in a, in a careful and thoughtful way probably the only way to go when it comes to China. Please join me in thanking Wendy very much for her insights this afternoon.